looking to expand his own knowledge of pipe reline and infrastructure rehabilitation, Brent Eckhart embarks on the journey into the no-day construction world while interviewing experts in all facets of the industry. Hoping to find answers here is Brett Eckhart with Reline Unknown. This podcast with Chris Larson from CNL Water Solutions was awesome. Chris is similar in age to myself, but has a ton more knowledge about the Reline industry. He's a second generation operator owner and all around smart guy. Take a listen. Thanks, Chris, for sitting down. Appreciate it. Good call on the breakfast this morning. The tacos were good. The mushroom tacos. That's a good spot. Um, spent the last few hours BSing with you, and that's been great. You're a family business, second generation guy. Um, so I'm a family business, third generation guy. So we cut from a similar cloth, a lot in common. Um, now let's get into a little bit of the, the reline stuff. So. Just give me a back, a little bit of background on you, your company, and yeah, yeah uh, seventy nine. The we started our, my parents started this business. I came along a, a few li- years later in eighty five, but uh, it was a, it was definitely a mom and pop show. We we ran uh, business out of their garage in a single car garage, uh, in a little uh, subdivision here in Centennial, Colorado. Um, the business was founded in part from my dad working for a plumbing company. The plumbing company went under in a big uh, development boom. Uh, they went under from that and uh, the districts that were left behind that they were doing a lot of the development work for came to my dad and said, hey, you were the lead guy there. We're left holding the bag, can you, can you help us out? So he uh, acquired a backhoe with uh, my grandfather, a little help from my grandfather and uh, they started running their business. And then from there on, it was about the same style business, emergency water and sewer repairs, 24 hours a day, 365, running special districts for uh, the next uh, about 25 years. And, uh, and then uh, my brother and I came into the business later on after as we grew. And uh, we, took a, we started adding trenchless capabilities into the repertoire of services and open cut, uh, mainline open cut services. So your brother, younger brother, or older brother? Older. Older yeah. brother. How many years? Uh, two. Two years older. Yeah. Okay. And you guys you guys kind of do it the right way. You guys kind of have, you have your lane, he has his lane, and you guys kind of are able to collaborate but not step on each other's toes too hard? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Actually, growing up, we were the type of uh, siblings that would beat the living piss out of each other, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, we were, uh, it wasn't probably... 10 years ago, we had our last fist fight right here in this office uh, <laughs> in front of all of our employees. So we actually grew up kind of uh, at odds with each other. We were totally different personalities. Um, I was very much the, the sports athletic, you know, go out with friends. And he was very much into computers and he was the quiet genius type, very good at school, didn't have to study. I had to study my butt off. Uh, so we didn't really ever get along growing up. And then um, we hit a point in life, it was actually him that, you know, can't hit a point in life where he kind of grew up a little bit faster than what I felt. I was always feeling feeling like I was more mature than him. And, uh-huh. he, and he actually mended our relationship and actually brought us together and nice. uh, was the more mature one. And, and uh, we are now so close and uh, we meet um, for breakfast every week, even though he runs a different type of business now. And uh, he's still our chief technology officer here at CNL, but we meet every week. We talk every day on the phone. We see each other often throughout the day as well. So we're very close. Good, good. I got two sons, that's why I'm like, yeah. I grew up with a sister, so I'm always curious hearing about two sons and family business, and I'm like, how deep am I gonna go with my boys? And am I, am I, are they, am I gonna be watching them fist fight in the office someday? Yeah. Or yeah, what I, is it, yeah, like, I, like, what's it gonna look like? Yeah, you know? I mean, one story, <laughs> one story. I, I, I was a big, you know, you you come back from the steel background, right? So yeah. you you like to go out with torches and the welding and fabricate stuff, I'm sure. You have stories yeah. doing that. Well, I'd, I would make go-karts and stuff, but out of tube steel that we had laying around, and I'd weld up go-karts and dune buggies and stuff like that. and. I remember being 13, 14 years old, and I had a tiff with him in our backyard right over here. And I, uh, guys were walking in from the end of the day, and him and I had an argument, and I ran, literally ran him down, and he went over the top of the roll cage. Uh, so <laughs> there will be blood. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm expecting it. It's already starting. Yeah. 
we still can't put a coffee table in the middle of our ha our living room because the boys are already starting to wrestle. So yeah. I know, I know it's coming. So CNL, you guys are obviously in the trench list, the uh, reline world, and you guys are also in the. There's there's basically two divisions of kind of what you guys. Yeah, we have doing, three. Right? Yeah, we have three. We have our traditional services division, which is our uh, we run water and sewer districts, or we help manage them. We take care of the operations side of, of special districts. Okay. Uh, specifically to water distribution and sewer collection. Then we have our open cut group, which is uh, mainline removal, replacements, uh, new installations, specifically just for federal, state, and local governments. And then we have our trenchless division, which we have uh, about nine different trenchless technologies that we operate in. Okay. So what was the main driver for you guys to, into the trenchless, the, the reline world industry? What was the kind of the, the spark that started the fire and it, to, for you guys to push into that? Yeah, it was, um, it was our customers essentially pushing on us. Our, our, uh, we've had some of the same customers for 40 years now, and they came to us and their boards come to us and say, you guys, you know, you take care of all of our needs, but we need to look at, you know, start getting into this trenchless stuff. Can you start looking into it? And then my father kind of started looking around on Google and found a, a German company out of uh uh, the Karlsruhe German Germany area called Perkazro and they're a little they're a well-known company and now at that time they're a little little known but they had some of the best gear in the world and we got involved with them and we were one of six seven people in the country that had that technology at the time it was robotics and UV cure technology for cure to place pipe and uh, we were kind of a lone wolf at that time, especially in the western half of the United States. Most of what happens in the U.S. moves from Europe and into the east and then moves to the west. So we were really kind of on our own. And uh, we took it. Uh, we pretty much put everything on the line as far as financial financially goes, leveraging our homes to get the loans to, to, to get the equipment. And made, we had to make it work at that time. Yeah. At that time, we were a really small company. We were only... 12 people, 13 people. Uh, we had all of our other work to do still. So we put everything on the line and then uh, that's what really got us into the business. And then it was very slow for the first couple of years, almost went out of business, getting ready to close up shop. And we acquired one large uh, job through a big general contractor um, out at the Denver Federal Center, which is here in, here in uh, downtown area of Denver. Uh, and we were lucky enough to acquire that contract, which we were, uh, uh, contracted to rehab all the sanitary sewer uh, pipe on that facility. It's the largest federal government facility in the United States. It's about 22,000, 23,000 feet of sewer oh, pipe. Wow. That carried us, got us the momentum we needed, the consistency that we needed to get, to get us going. During the course of that job, ironically, because it's a federal government complex, they buried whatever they had in the yard for their sewer pipe. So we yeah. encountered all different types of materials, undersized pipes, that led us into pipe bursting. So we got into the pipe bursting business because we needed to upsize some pipes and you can't dig out there. Um, so that was a that was a dig and replace job? It was, a, it was a dig and replace and a lining job. It started out like that. Okay. Um, we quickly realized there's contaminated soils on the site. You can't, it's just very difficult to dig. So they came to us and we started reaching out into our industry and the trenches industry and finding other methods. So we led into pipe bursting and then the manholes, they're like, well, if you don't have to dig uh, the pipe up, if you can pipe burst it, why do we have to replace the manholes? Can we rehab them? So then we got into manhole rehab, all, you know, all these things that about two or three additional technologies came out of that one job. And that's what springboarded us off into all the other work that we do now. It's yeah. that one, really that one job. It's, all, it's always fascinating to me how, how, how people get into the reline industry, right? Yeah. I've, I've always said that, I mean, our story of how we got into it was, you know, via purchasing Interflow and, and going the solid wall, mechanical joint route, and an industry that we didn't know really even was that in depth and existed that much. And we've been in the pipe business, you know, for a long time, you know, since the 70s, just like yourself. Um, so it's all, I'm always curious, like, hey, how did you get into it and kind of what was that? What was the main driver? So, um, when you guys got into the reline business, I mean, I always ask this question: Is there like a big eye opener? Is there something that you like didn't really anticipate or expect, or that was cool or just interesting about the reline industry? Um, I think you kind of answered as far as like running into all kinds of, you know, when you're doing that first job, you're running into all kinds of, you know, yeah. it's, it's kind of a 
what do you have? How do you? There's a learning things. curve. It's a learning curve. Right. It's also a you just you don't know what to, what's underneath the, what's what's buried, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we didn't. Um, you know, the, the cut and cover world. You know, going and throwing buckets in the ground. It's that's easy, really, when you think about it. I mean, it's not easy from the you know, social disruption and the economic disruption that it causes. Uh, you know, um, to what the public sees. But you can always, you know, stop for the day and pick up where you left off. Uh, there's always a way around it, but the costs go up. The costs keep going up. The the thing that we, you know, discovered with the trench list, there was a large learning curve, and you know, there there is a lot at stake. Every time you put a liner in the ground, you're affecting, you know, hundreds of feet of pipe at a time. Whether it's a slip line pipe or a CIPP pipe, if something goes wrong with trenchless, it's all wrong and it's all bad all at once. Yeah, and it's the little things that cause it to go wrong, like uh, not tying a rope the right way, or you know, not paying attention to one little detail in the pipe that can cause a puncture in your pipe or whatever. Uh, but what we uh, what we found is is that after that learning curve, uh, the trenchless really was. Uh, lowering our risk, it was mitigating our risk, it was, it was lowering our costs because if we controlled it right and we did it right and we applied the right product in the right situation, not trying to use a pipe wrench when you need a hammer type thing. Yeah, uh, the right tool for the, the job. Right tool for the job, yeah. right. Then uh, then it really actually uh, made life a whole lot easier than, than going the cut and cover route. So that was probably the, bigger, the biggest eye opener for us is we didn't realize how powerful it was, what we had our hands around. We were more trying to keep our head above water, but once we figured out how to swim, uh, life got really interesting. Because there's a there's a lot of work out there, right? I mean, that as far as I mean, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of more potential work that people don't even know because they haven't either inspected the pipe or they don't have the funds available to 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 re, to redo and, and rely on some of these projects. I mean, there's, yeah. I mean, I I think it's a it's a growing industry. I think there's a lot coming along the lines and us you know being in the west i'm from boise you're from the denver area um it's just starting to catch on compared to say the midwest yeah. and the east coast you know but yeah. well it's coming like a freight train it is coming like a freight train i think nationwide though i think it, it more so in the midwest and the west we have a bigger problem ahead of us that with with there's very little education out there as you and i were discussing a lot of folks don't even know what you know, actually, it's funny when I hear when I talk to an owner that doesn't know anything. They know of lining. They'll they'll call everything slip lining. Yeah. You know, CIPP is slip lining, and slip lining is slip lining. Uh -huh. You know, it's just uh, they they get the two the two confused. So there's a drastic need for education out there, um, but there is a big problem ahead of us where, especially in stormwater, uh, which is a lot of your business. Yeah. Um, we we see a big uh, disconnect on what people. Um, know is actually going on there because it's usually out of sight and out of mind most of our cross road culverts in rural areas are full of silt anyway so they don't even function yeah what they don't know is once you remove that silt that pipe probably going to collapse because the bottom's eaten out uh so we have a big issue especially in the stormwater side um, we haven't even really gotten a chance to touch all of our infrastructure our potable water infrastructure as we're seeing with the flint disaster and in other areas around the country where they're now starting to scrutinize. Uh, it's a disaster, it is, it is a looming crisis. Um, and we're not, we don't have the funds to touch it because the problem is when you look at, when was the last time you really realized how much did you pay for your sewer service? Yeah. It was like maybe included with your garbage collection, you know, for wastewater and, wa and waste management for the city you live in, you maybe pay 20 bucks a month for it. And then your water bill is maybe between a hundred and a, you know, or 80 to 100 bucks, depending on where you live. Some areas of the country, it's like 10 bucks if there's a plethora of water. Yeah. Uh, but it's not enough when you look at Excel energy, or like not Excel, but um, gas energy supply or electric energy supply. You're in the, if you run the heat all winter, you could be three, four hundred dollars for your bill. And you look at those utility companies and they're flush with money. They got nice trucks. And you look at your water department and they're running with the 1987 Chevy down the road. Uh, so we have a big disconnect in the country on what this infrastructure is worth to us, and we're not funding it like we should. We should be willing to pay more to get it up to grade because it is it is far, far behind all the other infrastructures. And that's kind of what this podcast is about, like you and I discussed, is it's as much about bringing awareness to the industry. It's about getting people aware of these problems that exist, what's going on, and the funds are going to have to be placed 
and be accounted for somehow, some way. We fight a similar battle on the recycling side is, you know, it's your trash costs five, six dollars and it disappears. Nobody ever knows, you know, that nobody wants to know where it goes. It's as long as it's not in their backyard or as long as it goes away. It's similar in the sewer water industry where, you know, as, hey, as long as I'm, I can turn on my faucet and I can get clean water and it's only cost me ten, twenty dollars a, a month, I'm okay with that, right? But people are, have to kind of understand that if you want clean water, it's not going to cost you twenty or thirty dollars a, a month. At some point, when the re, when the infrastructure wears out, like it's starting to, some those the, that, those funds have to come from somewhere. They do, and, yeah. And we can't rely on our government to to pull it out of their rear ends. We can, as the taxpayer, are going to have to pay for it. Yep. The user, the end user, will eventually have to pay for it. Um, it is great to see, though, um, that we're at a point in life where the technology has also come quite a long way. Yeah. A lot of the pipe you guys are in the business with, uh, you know, the spray technologies, the slip line pipe, the snap type pipe. Um, you know, in the past, that stuff wasn't uh, wasn't available. The techniques were available, but the technology's come a long way. Likewise, with the lining systems that we do, uh, the UVC IPP and the pipe bursting and the fusible C900s that's are out, the fusible PVCs that are out there nowadays. It's changing the game and it's making it more cost effective and we can get it done quicker uh, than we have been able to in the past or with putting starting putting the buckets in the ground. But we still have a situation where our infrastructure is failing faster than we have time or money for. So it's, it's pertinent that you know politically and, and locally, on a local level that we get moving forward and we start trying to start explaining that we're gonna have to pay more for this stuff. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And so my, my, that, my question for you is, I mean, you guys, you say you operate in like basically nine different trenchless technologies. Yeah. Do you guys have uh, a couple or that you're in your wheelhouse or that you see the most call for in this area? I mean, just having the ability to do nine different ones is awesome, right? Yeah. It's like being the Swiss Army knife of Reline, you know, I mean, you have the ability to do it because the more I've dived deep into this industry, there is no set one size fits all product that, that goes in every pipe. You know, mm -hmm. I, I've really kind of, that's, if I've taken away one thing in the last two years, that's it. Yeah. So in this area and with your company, is there, I mean, what drives the bus for you more than any other um, pro product. I mean, a couple or two, three, four, whatever it, you know, kind of you feel is. Yeah, your it, it, I, I guess it depends on what sector you're in. If you're in the sanitary sewer market, our our go tos have been the UV cure, uh, uh, LMK lateral rehabilitation systems, which is called the T liner system. Okay. Uh, and then manhole rehabilitation. We have three different manhole or structure rehab options of epoxy coatings, geopolymers, and uh, stru uh, structural inserts. Structural inserts where you pop the lid off or the cone off the structure and you install a fiberglass reinforced uh, polymer or polymer manhole inside of the existing manhole and you grout the inner space and it thereby replaces the concrete manhole with a corrosion resistant structure. Uh, so that's in the sanitary sewer space. The stormwater space is a real, I really enjoy stormwater to be honest. It's lower stress. You're not bypassing sewer flows. You're not worrying about homeowners backing up or coming out to complain. You're in a much different type of market. And there's a lot more options available, I believe, in the stormwater market. You have a dozen different slip line products on yeah. the market. You have spray uh, products on the market. and. Uh, you can also use uh, the cured in place pipe aligning for for the pipes, and then the structures, the inlet structures, and all those types of structures can be coated with uh, corrosion resistant coatings. And sometimes well. products that maybe weren't even intended to be reline products yeah. initially, when they were probably going through R and D. Yeah, and now you're starting that, to see some of those products come in and be potential yeah. reline uh, opportunities. Yeah, right? uh, the one I saw recently that blew me away is is a Rhino lining. Uh, for the Rhino lining in the back of pickup trucks is now yeah. applying their their coating into uh, infrastructure solutions. Huh. So that's another one that blew us away. But yeah, that, that's I mean that's what we like to do for the sewer and the storm is the geopolymers as well and the, the CIPP and, and then you know snap type pipe and those types of solutions for slip lining. Uh, and then in the in the you know, water side, um, the advent which is recently in the last uh, twelve years or so of Fusible PVC products now uh, being available has really changed the game for like waterline pipe bursting. Uh, it's been a very advantageous product for that. 
Um, there's some uh, in its infancy stages, I believe, still, but there are some CAPP products for waterline. Waterline is a whole different animal. Yeah. The problem right. the problem with water is, is it's a shallower infrastructure. It doesn't need need to be as deep as say sewer or, or in some of your storm water cases where. Uh, the replace removal and replacement of, of water is still relatively cheap compared to digging 10, 12, 15, 18 feet deep for sanitary sewer. So open cut removal and replacement methods are still a predominant method for water because uh, your trenchless methods that are available out there, the material cost, because it's drinking water, it is potable water, are so high. And it's pressurized. It's pressurized. Yeah, you add all these elements, elements, to elements it, into right? it. And, and if you have a little bit of error in there, boy, you're you're going down the road real quick. Yeah. yeah. So when you guys are, you know, I assume you didn't just automatically start with nine trenchless technologies. Like you eventually kind of evolved. You found yeah. one. And, oh, well, that one's good. We could we could deploy that for this job and yeah. this one for that job. And what do you use for resources when you're looking for, like what's up and coming, what's new? I mean, is it a trade show thing? Is it just you know, is it just scanning the internet, looking at case studies? I mean, you've written a couple case studies. From what I've heard, I mean, what, what, what? How do you find what's new and what's coming up? Yeah, exactly. I, I would say the the big one uh, is trade shows, and then social media is another one. But being connected internationally, so we we go to a lot of international trade shows. Okay. And then we'll connect with folks uh, at those international trade shows, and we'll LinkedIn is believe it or not is a big one They're everywhere around the world, and you connect with folks on LinkedIn or or Twitter or Facebook. And when you're once you're connected, then you're seeing uh, projects that are happening all around the world. And and we think we have complicated infrastructure. Go over to old, you know, world Europe, and and those tech areas where they have brick paved, thousand year old roads. Yeah, you know, and they had to real quick figure out how to avoid digging that kind of infrastructure up when you have buildings that are 15 feet apart and your road is only 10 feet, 12 feet wide. Oh yeah, you know. So uh, we found that being an international um, voyager, so to speak, and going out and researching, you know, what what the Chinese are doing, what the Germans are doing, what's what's UK doing, and, and showing up and shaking hands and being active. That's where we found a lot of uh, what we do. Yeah, no, I, and that's I, that's the first time I've heard anybody really say that going to the international. I was in Ireland last year, and we went to the Guinness factory, mm -hmm. and and that that Guinness factory has been there for two hundred years, two and some change, something like that, and it just built on and added on to it over the years. But uh, what's crazy about that is the brick roads and yeah. the infrastructure there, and you're like, you know, it's it's a whole different ball game, and I could see where. Everything is tighter, so I could see where being able to apply some of what the what they're doing over here, where we're a little bit more wide wide open, where we're a little bit newer, you yeah, know, yeah. we got a little more real estate to work with. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the ground footprint in America, in America is huge. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So, um, is it without naming any uh, specific job sites or you know contracting? Is there any any time you've ever went into a job and had to? fix somebody else's work or is there or something that wasn't done correctly or the wrong product was used and if so um why do you think that that, that product was used um just as a or is, are you guys just strictly just trying to put out fires that haven't been put out yet no we're we're a little bit of both we we get uh we're like i said uh, i was talking to you earlier we're a little bit of a niche contractor we don't bid a lot of work um we we work when primarily based on relationships. Um, so those relationships usually call us up when they find something that's maybe a few years out of warranty and it's failed and they come have us come in and analyze, was it the wrong product? Did we specify the wrong product for this application or was there a contract or material uh, error here and how can we correct that if we reapply the same same product or in, into this application? So we, have to, we attack it from both sides. And there are, we're, we're in a couple of contracts right now where there's some extensive warranty issues that weren't addressed and wrong product, wrong application, you know, and, and we're in there. Is that cost driven a lot of times? Do you think people are putting yeah, it absolutely. in there just because they're trying to save a little bit of money on the front end, not really realizing that it's going to cost you oh, yeah. a little more money on the back end? Oh, yeah. End well, that's, that's, a, fix. that's a really sore subject with me. Um, it's a, it's a, 
it's an American trait that I wish we didn't have, and that's addiction to low price. Yeah. And it doesn't. I've I've lost bids. We were talking about the one I just recently lost. I yeah. lost it by a thousand dollars on a hundred. Or was it 340 grand or something along those lines? Yeah, hundred a thousand dollars, and then I know the the product that's going in there, and I'm sitting there going, "Oh Lord, help me!" Yeah, you know, you know, and it, it had nothing to do with the the contractor or anything like that, but it's it's the product application. Trigger. Yeah, yeah, and it like I, I was telling I was telling some folks the other day, I said, you know, you have the, the you have manholes, and and everybody's like, "Oh, this product stinks, and mine's better," and. And I'm like, no, you know, it's not so much the product as in this particular case, if you don't do the substrate preparation, right? You, I can get latex paint to last longer than your epoxy is going to last on that wall because I'm going to prep the surface right. Yeah. It's like um, a paint a car. Yeah. If you don't do the body work, yeah. you don't sand it, you don't get all the imperfections out before you paint, you're going to see everything and it's going to, it's not going to last. Yeah. So, and that's the problem with bill prices is that those little, uh, fine key points that get missed in specifications, uh, are, are, are overrun by the contractor's desire to get the job. And then they'll, they'll put in the cheapest product they can find on top of that. They're going to skip a, B and C steps. Mm -hmm. And by the time their taillights go over the top of the hill and their warranty is gone, they're, they're long gone and the owner's left holding the bag. Yeah. So that is a problem, a, a huge problem. We need to move from being addicted to low price and addicted to cheap, uh, inferior, or inadequately designed products for those applications uh, to sustainable design and qualified installers, not based on price. Because there's, there's some products you have to be a qualified installer to even to even step on the job site. And there's some products that are like, yeah, this is a self-performing or whatever, you know, anybody can install it. And I've always been curious of who determines, I would assume it's the manufacturer that determines whether their product can be installed by any Joe Blow or yeah. it, is that is that driven by the manufacturer? Usually it can be driven by the manufacturer, but where the owner has a card in this game is, is by specifying having strong uh, qualification and performance. The other key word is performance based specifications. If it's performance qualifications and performance based, then they're choosing a product set based on prior history and application to that particular job. And then the, the, uh, uh, the qualifications of the contractor uh, being they have a prior history yeah. applying with a, you know, a well-documented history with references and whatnot, applying that product to, to that specific application. That's what we're actually seeing and we're pushing for more of construction management at risk type work, design build type work, CMGC type work, where the pricing is integrated into a, in a um, RFQ format where the product, the contractor, the references, their safety record, their financials, and their price for construction are all considered as a part of the proposal. Not just the price. Not just the price. Yeah, which makes sense because, you know, when you're dealing with infrastructure, and especially if you're dealing with potable water or sewer or you know some big stormwater runoff that's that's crucial to keeping the flow correct, so you're not flooding out people's houses or whatever the case may be, I mean it, it's not it shouldn't be just a price issue. I mean there's there's like you're saying you guys have been doing it in, since the late '70s, doing it this long. You you've been through the gamut. You know you kind of are pretty well versed in a. a different applications, but B, what can go wrong if it's not done correctly. And you shouldn't be able to just start up and fire up and fire some little price out and then go try and figure out how to do the job once you get there yeah, exactly. and what products you're going to use. You yeah. Know? yeah. <laughs> so is there, uh, is there a common obstacle um, or unusual expense that you kind of have to take into account for your real projects? Um, is it, is there something out there that's, yeah, just the unknown. I, I think there's um, there's there's always unknown and risk that's carried into any project, but usually price compensates for risk that the contractor takes. Although I wish more contractors would bid more risk into their jobs, but that's for them to decide. Um, it is, um, like I said, with trenchless. If you're going to get into the business of trenchless, be prepared to be a detail oriented company. If you, if you ignore the details or if you're more focused on how fast can I get this done, yeah, you're going to miss one key step and it could be five minutes of doing X, Y, Z 
and then you go to do the next step in the process and the whole thing will the whole tower come tumbling down and that's really the the one thing that i would say in estimate preparation or whether your d decision or, of getting into the business or not the key the fact is is you have to be prepared to be detail orientated and methodical if you if you're that way and you're uh, and on the customer side, if you're service orientated, trenches will be a good business for you. If you're not, and you're a blow and go guy, yeah, it's gonna kick you in the butt. So, in your opinion, then you think that you'd have to be even more detail oriented on the trenchless side than like your open cut. Oh like, yeah, yeah. And, you know, yeah. Because let's stuff. you look at open cut. You go down the road and you start ripping up asphalt, and uh, you don't pull your box tight to your your, your uh, installation process and you leave a little bit of gap in between boxes, for example, and you have a cave off. Mm -hmm. It's not the end of the world. Yeah, it stinks, but it's not the end of the world. In trenchless, that one little gap that you leave in between the processes takes all that pipe that you just put in the ground to open cut and it, and it, it to put a bomb inside of it and blow it up. Yeah. Yeah. You know, start, the, from, start, start from, from scratch. scratch. Start yeah. again. Yeah. <laughs> so, what do you enjoy the most about the you know your job the you know the remind industry as a whole both like what's what kind of is makes it easy for you to get out oh oh it's definitely the people yeah starting with our own um my managers my crews um everybody in our supply chains uh my mentors are all people uh i i didn't learn the trenchless business uh from hard knocks i I started my foundation in trenchless came from my mentors and those are people that have been doing this for longer than I've been alive even. And so like what's give me a mentor or two, give me like somebody that's that, that's helped you a ton. Uh, name yeah, sure there's a ton and I yeah, there's a there's a bunch. Um uh Mark Hallett with Sartex Multicom, uh, Dave Holcomb with TT Technologies, um uh Mike Jarrett with L K Technologies. Uh, these guys are definitely strong mentors of mine. I admire them, and um, they've taught me a lot um, about the business. And uh, yeah, that's that's on the mentorship side. The, 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 the people is great in the supply chain, and then the people on the business side. You know, sure. Just, uh, I like I was telling you in the car the other day. I when a lot of people at the end of the year look at their financial statements, and they'll go through and they'll look at okay, you know, here's my cost, here's my gross profit, here's my net. You know, what, what did I you know. What did I make on the year? And I look at okay, how many new families did we bring in in the yeah. this year? Yeah, and that's how I measure success and how you know the you know you and I were talking about just the, the HR driven company. Yeah, you know, exactly. not a P and L driven company. Yeah, I mean, HR driven company. Obviously, yeah. you have to make money to keep the yeah. lights on. I mean, right. that's and there's, that's there's, that's so different than a tech business or a you know a door business. Yeah. But you, you still. If you're an HR driven company, it's easier to grow because people actually know you care about their livelihood and how they're feeding their families. Exactly. Yeah, that's definitely the payoff for me. Yeah. And you get to work still work with your parents? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's enjoyable and not. But yeah. yeah. It has its moments. I know yeah. firsthand, like I'm the yeah. if anybody can speak on that, like I have my uh, I've got my, I've had my battles as well. Good and bad, but I mean I wouldn't have it any other way. Right, you know, I agree with you. Yeah. So, last question uh, is, what can be done, in your opinion, to just bring more awareness to the reline industry as a whole and the infrastructure issues as a whole that that we're as a country we're facing. You know, and people talk about the infrastructure, the airports, and this and that, but I think that the the water, the the sewer, the um, the runoff, all that, those kind of get glossed over. Um, but is what, you, in your opinion, can drive more awareness? Um, exactly what we're doing here today. You guys are doing um, exactly what we should be doing in today's age, is, is, is reaching out to our youth and energizing them. Mm -hmm. uh, and letting them know that there is a, a career and a lifestyle that can be had that I think the tables have flopped. Everybody, my, when I was growing up, my parents were like, you don't want to work in the pipe business. Yeah. Look at your father. He come, I would walk on my dad's back and after you get home from work and I'd feel the knots in his back loosen up. I remember just walking on his back as a little kid to get him to relax after work. 
you tell me you don't want to work in this business go be a doctor or a lawyer go yeah. be go be a stock trader or something like that and make a ton of money and, uh, and now all my friends that when i went to college with there's still some of them looking for for the jobs they went to and got their education in yeah so i think the tables have turned and we have such a drastic um disconnect especially in quantity of, of high quality people that want to come into this this arena so i think if we can reach out to the the, the generations coming up and those people will include the people that will be managing the state agencies the government agencies uh, that will be driving this work yeah. and I think that we need to do more of this we need to do more of the social media we need to do lunch and learns old-fashioned lunch and learns yeah we need to do old-fashioned shaking hands and, and we need to um, mobilize uh, a force that is out to to get the word out and let it be known that we got some problems coming folks and we need to get on it. Get them addressed. Yeah. yeah. All right. If people want to get a hold of you, uh, CNL, what's the best way to uh, get a hold of you? Email, website, what's the, like, yeah. what's the best way to get a hold of you? Yeah, email would probably be the easiest. Um, uh, my email is uh, C Larson, L-A-R-S-O-N at C-L-W-S-I.com. That's C-N-L Water Solutions Inc. So and the website is, website is www.clwsi.com. Awesome. Cool. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. America's aging underground infrastructure will need to be dealt with in the upcoming years. Our mission with Reline Unknown is to help individuals and organizations gain insight into the pipe, reline, and infrastructure world and help process the key decision, reline or replace. Thank you for listening.